Somebody say, thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, man, I'll tell you, that's good, 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 good. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I want to read a profession, and then we're going to get right into the Word of God here this morning. I want to minister something to you in regard to kindness. A little phrase that we don't find much in this society, but I feel today that the Lord wants me to minister on that. But let's read this profession together. Thank you, Lord, for your word. I am open. I am ready to believe. I am ready to receive. Your word is life to all that I am and all that I do. Your word is health to all my flesh. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my pathway. Your word is life. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to read in just a moment out of the book of Second Peter. And uh, we, will, we will get into that in just a second. But it just seems like, I, you know, I've been talking a lot about the provision that God has for us, our place in the kingdom. And many times people almost become mechanical in the sense that they feel like I put in my quarter and I'm, you know, almost like a slot machine, you know. I'm, I'm, but there's more to it than that. There's attitudes that we have, dispositions that we carry that position us in life. There's times when people make the statement, how come I can't get forward in life? And many times it's because of your attitude. Your attitude makes a tremendous difference. And the attitudes that are carried come from the presence and the nature of God. You need to be manifesting the nature of God. The Bible says, as a matter of fact, we know we pass from death to life. Why? Because we love the brethren. So the gauge about whether we're even saved or not is seen in how we respond to people around us. And that's the determination right there. We know that. We know we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. So I want to say that there are times whenever God's wanting to do some things in your life, but he can't do it because of attitudes that we allow the world system or whatever to come in, creep in, and become a part of us. And as believers, we've got to guard our hearts against these things. I just see so many things today where the world seems like has gone crazy and the distrust and the hatred and the division that you just see in so many people, I'm thinking they're not very nice. I mean, they're not. You hear words like uh, anger and rage, road rage. I don't know how many of you have ever been involved in a road rage incident where somebody just kind of just loses it. You know, they just, and, and it's like all of the built-up stuff that they've been carrying focuses on an incident and they just lose their cool altogether. They, they just blow up. But our world is becoming more and more like that. And we must not be conformed to that way of living. As a believer, it's important if you're wanting the kingdom of God to function in your life, it's important that you see these little things like this can either add to and assist you in your effort to walk in the kingdom or can keep you from operating in it at all. See, many times the Bible, the Bible even says that a person's prayers are hindered because of certain things. They didn't walk in love. They walk in strife and contention. And as a believer, you can't do that. It, it, we, we can't afford to allow ourselves to do that, to even accept that in our family. I, I think it's important, you know, I talked a few moments ago concerning our, our being a family. We, we, need to become, we need to become the thermostat that says this is what our family feels like and looks like. There's some things that are not acceptable. Now, I'm not saying you don't blow it or don't say something you shouldn't have said. If you've been married more than five minutes, you probably have said something to your mate you shouldn't have said. It's the truth. I mean, that's just the way it is. 
you're, you're not perfect, you're going to end up doing something like that, but it's important that you realize and back up and say, wait a minute, that's not who we are. And, and those are the things that are passed down to the next generation because values are caught more than they're taught. The, the, the little children see behaviors in our life and they, they grow up thinking those behaviors are normal. That's the way it's supposed to be. Some children that are raised in abusive or very difficult situations, it's not uncommon for them to grow up, get married, and marry into an abusive situation because they think that's the way it's supposed to be. So it's important that you realize that there are some things that are needful in your life for you to be successful, and there are some things that are simply unacceptable for you. Behaviors that are unacceptable for you. Amen. I didn't say one word. Second Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1, verse... We might as well go ahead and start reading in verse 1. Here's what it says. You got that ready? Simon Peter a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that obtained precious faith, like precious faith, with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. He's talking to you. He's talking to believers. He said, grace and peace be multiplied to you through the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. When you become rooted and grounded in love and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace is going to be multiplied to you. Now, I want you to get here verse 3 and verse 4. According as his divine power has given us all things. Everybody say all things. Now, what, what are all things? That things that, that depends on what you need. What do you need? He's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him. Now, what's the knowledge of him? Well, the knowledge of him that you have is the word of God. The word of God is the knowledge of him, and he's given us through that Bible. That, that Bible is more than just some religious thing you do. That is your lifeline. It's in the word of God that the plan of God and the provision of God is revealed. So he said, according as his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life, and that pertain to God through the knowledge of him that called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. Now, where are those promises? They're in your lap. That's in the, that's in the Bible there. Those Greeks saying that by these promises, you might be partakers of the divine nature. Now, how am I going to be transformed? Well, it's by turning over new leaf. Nope. It's the Word of God that transforms you. You've got to hide the Word of God in your heart. So he said, it has been given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these promises you might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now, I want to read the rest of this because this is something that we don't realize affects us. Now, all of this that I'm about to read to you has to do with your disposition your attitude, and your actions, okay? He said, besides this, give all diligence. Add to your faith virtue, and to your virtue, knowledge. And to your knowledge, temperance, and to your temperance, patience. And to your patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness. And then to brotherly kindness, he said, charity. Now, verse 8 says this, if these things, what things? Virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, charity. If these things be in you and abound, they will make you that you're neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. What knowledge is he talking about? We'll go back up to verse 3 and verse 4 where he said he's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him. So that means that if you lack these things, that that knowledge can be unfruitful. You know all the scriptures on healing, but you can't get healed. You know all the scriptures on blessing, but you don't, you're not walking in blessing. 
It's more than just saying, I confess that Jesus is Lord and I confess that's mine. It's more than that. There are attitudes that you have that literally can affect how this works in your life. And it's so important that you realize as a believer that what you do impacts what happens in your life. And you get to the place that it's not working for you. I'm a believer, I love God, but the Bible's not working for me. You know, <laughs> Paul made the statement, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, he said, I desire to feed you with meat, but I couldn't do it. He said, I could only feed you with milk because you were babies. You were, you were carnal. There's envy and jealousy and division among you. And he said, I couldn't take you where I wanted to take you. And don't you realize God wants to take us places we've never been and show us things we've never seen, but he can't do it because, because we can't take that meat. There's envy, there's jealousy, there's division, there's attitudes that we have. Now, I'm not saying be passive in what you believe. You be strong in what you believe. You stand strong on what you believe. What I said concerning the issue of abortion, baby, I'm not budging off that. I don't care. I don't, I don't care if they shut the whole thing down. We're not moving off of that. I'm going to stand strong in that area, and, and our values will never change. It's wrong. It's it's evil, it's wrong, and there's too many things that we can do to help people who can't keep their baby. We'll find somebody that will take that baby for them. That's the truth. We, we do not have to, to go that direction. So I will not be passive about that. But I will also not carry strife and bitterness in my heart because it affects me. See, you can't hate someone else and it not come back and bite you. You know, it's, it's, it's like it, feeding yourself poison, wishing somebody else would die. Listen, it's going to affect you. You can't allow these things. Somewhere, you're going to have to create a disconnect between the things that you can't change and the things you can. And then you're going to have to understand, I'll be what I can be, and I will stand where I'm at, but I'm not going to allow myself to get into hate and over things that affect me spiritually in my home. Because I'll just tell you right now, I need healing to work in my body. I need the blessings of the Lord to work in my body. I need the Word of God to produce for me, and I don't need to be doing things that's going to cause it to stop working. And so he said there, he said, if these things be in you and abound... They will make you that you're neither barren nor unfruitful. See, you can have knowledge, it's unfruitful. I know the scriptures, but it's not working for me. So I have to go back when things appear unfruitful and just gird my mind up with these other areas. Do I have something in my heart that is not right? So he said, if these things be in you and abound, they will make you that you're neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. But, but he that lacks these things, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, he that lacks these things is blind and can't see afar off, and he's forgotten what God's done for him. And then he said in verse, verse 10, he said, Wherefore, the rather brethren, give diligence to make your calling election sure. For if you do these things, these things I just said to you, you will never fall. Can you imagine being in a situation where you will never fall? Now, I didn't make that up. That's right there in the Bible. That's in verse 10 of 2 Peter chapter 1. If you do these things, you'll never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior. In other words, when you do these things, it keeps an entrance open. It keeps a flow from the kingdom of God into your life all the time. And you can be going through the most terrible things, but your prayers aren't hindered. Even the Bible said a husband and wife must not strive because their prayers are hindered. Can you imagine that? Now, what is more common that the enemy doesn't come in and try to bring division between a husband and wife? And what happens? The Bible says their prayers are hindered. 
So, so it's interesting to me, though, in all of this that I just read to you, that kindness is mentioned. I never thought about kindness being one of the things that, that either the, the lack of kindness hindering God from working in my life, or the embracing of kindness opening the door to the kingdom of God. Just being kind. So it's interesting that kindness is one of the things that makes or prevents the promises of God from happening. Kindness isn't being weak. It's responding in a way that God would respond to a situation. Kindness is initiating something. It's not just a mental attitude that you have. It talks about those things when we're dealing with patience and godliness and and, but, but kindness reaches outside of you toward people that are around you. Kindness isn't being weak. It's responding to others in a right way. It's initiating something. When I become kind to someone, I am reaching out to them with something that they probably didn't deserve. See, God was kind to us. We didn't deserve that. We are so judgmental. And isn't it, isn't it crazy that we can be so judgmental of other people in light of the way we've been dealt, handled in the midst of our transgressions? I can only say God has been kind to me. He has given me a double portion of his loving kindnesses and his tender mercies. How can I then take you by the throat and hold you down for something that you've done when I've been handled so graciously and so kindly? But it said here that kindness is part of the thing that makes the kingdom of God work for you. Now, I love this. and I wanted to bring this to you. Jesus changed a popular proverb that was used in the Jewish culture that was basically set up on the, the term an eye for an eye and a tooth for, for a tooth. And they, he changed that proverb that said, don't do to others what you don't want them to do to you. See, that, that was kind of the proverb that they held to. Don't, don't do something to um, someone else that you don't want them to do for you because it's an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But that was a negative aspect of the proverb that was just too passive. Jesus, in contrast, said this. He said this in Matthew 7 and 12. He said, do to others. See, this is a command to act. Luke 6.31 says this. Do to others as you want them to do to you. Not don't do to somebody else what you don't want them to do. But Jesus became proactive with it and he said, do to others what you want them to do. Matthew 7 and 12 said this, So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you, for this sums up the law and the prophets. I mean, that's such a powerful word right there. So Jesus said, take the initiative. I'm not just going to not do something to them that I don't want them to do to me, but rather I'm going to flip that around and I'm going to do something for you that I would want you to, how do I measure what they want? How do I measure what they need? Well, what would I like to have done to me? I'm going to do that to them. Do I see them in trouble? Do I see them in need? Angie and I, we were driving to uh, Elgin the other day, and of course it's seven miles from here to, to Elgin. And uh, we passed this guy, and you know, he, he just didn't look like somebody that would be walking or a hitchhiker, and he was, his arms were loaded with groceries. And I'm just telling you, he looked whipped. He did. He just looked like he'd walked from Los Angeles to here is what he looked like. And so we stopped and turned around and went back to pick him up. Now, I'm always a little cautious of anybody that I might pick up, but this one just seemed different. And I stopped, and I got out of the car and walked, and I said, you okay? He said, yeah. And I said, would you like a ride? And he said, oh, yeah. <laughs> and so he got in the car, and he said, where are you going? And he said, well, it's still a few miles down the road. And it was. It was probably about three or four miles that he had yet to go. And we got to talking to him, and he had walked from Maynard. And he said, 
nobody picked me up. He said, one guy stopped and said, hey, are you all right? He said, yeah, I'm all right. The guy got in his car and drove off. <laughs> Thanks a lot. But the fact is, I saw that guy, and I wanted, I didn't have to. It was just an act of kindness. I wanted to extend something to him, even though he didn't know me. I reached out to him because I would certainly want him to reach out to me if I was in that situation. And I think that there's a lot of times people in your life come and go where you have an opportunity. Now, you don't have to have a Messiah complex. It's not up to you to save the world and fix everybody's problem. You can't do everything, but you can do something. And it initiates something in your life. When I use that tool of brotherly kindness, it initiates the kingdom of God in my life to where the kingdom starts working for me. An entrance into the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, according to this scripture, is opened up to me abundantly. But see, we've gotten to the place that we're so afraid of each other. Things have changed, and I know it's a, it's a terrible world. It may not be as bad or as dangerous as we feel like it is. I remember when I was a kid, that was back in the Leave it to Beaver days. I remember when I was a kid, we'd go out the door and, come on, what did mom always say to you? Be back by dark. Now, we didn't have cell phones. We didn't have anything. We would just up and take off. And we've got to the place now to where, the, and the problem is, is that news is so readily available to us that we'll hear something that happened in Detroit like it happened next door. And we're afraid. It gets to where we're afraid. And we are so engulfed by fear that we can't even let our kids outside anymore. We become imprisoned in our own fears. Now, again, I'm not talking about being foolish. And I'm not talking about being, not, being watchful. But we've come to the place that we become so impersonal. And technology has really enabled that to even increase. I don't even have to go to the store anymore. Did you know that? I just simply punch something in my computer, and they will deliver it to my house. I can slide the money. I don't even have to slide the money. I pay online. You know, I can just say, leave it at the door. And they'll leave it at the door and take off. I don't have to associate with anyone. I don't have to connect with anyone. You know, in that sense, I don't know that it's healthy. I, I don't know. The reason is, is because you impact the generation around you and you can't impact them if you don't say hello I I, I believe very strongly in private schools I believe very strongly in you doing whatever you want I don't like the government telling me what to do but at the same time we get to the place that we're afraid to put our children in places because we're so terrified they're going to be. You ever see someone, you ever see someone who is so germ conscious and their kids are the ones in the emergency room more than anybody else? But you take this kid out that eats dirt off of a spoon <laughs> and, and he's tougher than dirt, man, I'm just telling you. And he don't ever get sick. You're thinking, that kid ought to be dead by now. But he ain't, man. He's going to live to 150. Sometimes what we're afraid of handicaps us to the point that we can't even live life anymore. And we come to the place that we're afraid of everybody to the point that we lose the opportunity to be kind to someone again I'm not telling you to tolerate what's wrong if something is wrong condemn it set it in order but don't keep an attitude about it come on you know <laughs> when I was raised we felt like if we ever got in a fight in our family we had to be mad at least two weeks Angie's family it cracked me up because when I first got with them 
her and Michelle or whoever would have an argument, and five minutes later they'd go, hey, let's go to the mall. You know, I'm thinking, wait a minute, you can't make up like that. <laughs> this is, <laughs> that's wrong. You gotta, you gotta hold on to that for a little while. <laughs> okay, I'm not gonna ask for a raise of hands as to how many of you have experienced that same thing. Jesus changed the proverb and made it say, do to others what you would want them to do to you. You take the initiative. Don't wait. Be kind. Just be kind. You know, someone opens the door for someone. They didn't have to do it. They were just being kind. You know, I've gone to the grocery store before and I can see people trying to count through their money, their pennies. And I would pull money out of my wallet just to pay for it. I didn't have to do that. I did it because it was an act of kindness. Don't wait for someone else to do something before you respond. Initiate the power. Initiate the action. You need to walk around in your life looking for opportunities to be kind to someone. Kindness makes a difference. And I'm just going to tell you something. If you cease to be a kind person and you become a cynical person, you're not very pretty anymore. Beauty is not seen in telling people off. Beauty is seen in walking in love and walking in kindness toward other people. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10. Can I read this one to you? I love this. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those that belong to the family of believers. As you have an opportunity. You don't may not have the opportunity, but someplace, somewhere, you have a divine appointment and a divine contact, and there's an opportunity for you to do what? To do good. To be kind. You didn't have to do it. And, and listen, in being kind, that's not just saying you're saintly. You know, I'm better than someone else. No, that should just be a reaction of who you are. I'm a blessed person. I walk in the love of God. I know what it is to receive God's grace. And as a result, I just want to be kind. You know, I, I have found that there are rude people in the world, but usually, you ever, have you ever dealt with a company that was just mean and rude? Anybody here ever done that? Do you know it's almost always middle management? When you get to the top man in the place, you usually find someone, when you come to the top dog, he's usually pretty sharp, pretty kind, pretty open. It's the truth. It's when people have something to prove. It's when somebody becomes intolerant of someone else. Well, they're taking up my space. I... I, I've driven down the road before and I wasn't going quite fast enough and someone would come up and you could just see the, the anger and the rage and I'm thinking this may have delayed you maybe 1.3 seconds but on top of that you're not that important that I would disrupt your life to the point that... You, Come on, I mean, let's think about this for a few moments. I'm finding that the older I get, the more laid back I become. I'm not sure what that is. Somebody will do something stupid and I'll go, well, that was stupid. <laughs> but it doesn't, it doesn't bother me. Maybe it's maturing a little bit. Maybe it's growing up a little bit. I think when it comes to our dealing with other people, we need to grow up and we need to mature. Amen. Displays of kindness. You didn't have to do that. That was really very kind of you. You didn't have to say that. That, 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 was, just, that was kind of you to do that. See, that's not weakness. Baby, that's strength. That's exactly what that is. Now, let me, let me just read this to you, Ephesians 4 and verse 32. I love this one. Be ye kind one to another. 
Well, don't you love it when I just pull out all these scriptures on you like this? Tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, forgave you. In other words, you treat other people the way God treated you. That's what that means. And he said there, be kind. I didn't think about kindness as being forgiveness. Did you know that for you to forgive somebody that has done you wrong, that's an act of kindness? It's truth. For somebody to offend you, hurt you, take advantage of you, and you to forgive them, that's an act. Now, God's not making you forgive anybody. He's telling you to. But that is something that you have power over, that you initiate. And I'm going to forgive you. Now, don't boast over, I, I shall forgive you. You know, come on, come on. Don't, don't you hate it when somebody does that? You just want to smack them, and then you need to get forgiveness all over again. Yes, in my goodness, I, I will let you buy it this time. Now, that's not forgiveness, number one. But it's so important for you to realize that forgiveness is an act of kindness. Can I just say this to you right now? There's some of you, maybe you have people in your life, at your work, at your job, in your family, a relative, that you need to show kindness toward and forgive them. You need to forgive them. Now, God, he tells you to do that because he said, look, if I'm going to forgive you on this level, you know, I've forgiven you of a life of debt. Don't take somebody by the throat for $20. You treat people the way I treat you. So kindness is an act. Forgiveness is an act. And if you will, you don't have to make a big parade but just out of kindness, you need to say this concerning them. I forgive you. I'm going to let it go. You didn't have to do that. You didn't have to. It was a kind thing to do. It was a godly thing to do. And I want to just say this to you. You could hold on to it, but you're better than that. You are. You're better than that. You're a better person than that. And you've got too many things in front of you to spend your whole life looking in the rearview mirror at things that happened to you behind you. So this morning, as just before I pray, I want to just encourage you to become kind to other people, tender-hearted toward them. I learned more what tender-hearted means when I had grandkids. Now, I had it with my kids, but when I had grandkids, there was a, there was a tender spot that they find in me that I don't have toward anybody else. And I learned that's what tenderness means. I'm tender toward them. There's no hardness in my heart. And that's how God wants you to be toward that person you're sitting next to. Be kind to them, tender-hearted, forgiving one another the way that God, for Christ's sake, forgave you. It's an act of kindness. And while love is certainly something that we are, kindness is something that we do. And this morning, I want to just say to you, God has plans for your life. But kindness is going to have to be a part of it to the point. And you need to think about that when you say things about someone else. Is what you're saying. Matter of fact, the Bible said don't say anything except it ministers grace to the hearer. I'm not going to gossip about anybody. I'm not going to talk about them. I'm not going to say anything unless it's to fix something. Okay? Why? Because you're better than that. You're better. And so I just want you right now, would you, would you sit down with me and embrace this verse from 1 Peter chapter 1 where he said, add to your godliness brotherly kindness. 
Because of these things, like brotherly kindness be in you, they will make you that you're neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. But it said, he that lacks these things is blind and can't see afar off, and he's forgotten what God did for him. But he said, if you'll do these things, an entrance of a, an abundant entrance into the kingdom of God will be provided for you. And I'll just tell you the truth. If you'll learn to walk in these things and keep the right attitude, you'll walk in the kingdom 24 hours a day. Amen. Amen. Kindness. Kindness. I want you all to bow your heads with me for just a moment. Father, we want to say thank you, first of all, for being so kind to us. Thank you for being so kind to us. I didn't deserve it. <laughs> Lord, you know I didn't deserve it. Father, I was dead in my trespasses and sins. The Word of God said this concerning me, said I was without God, without a covenant in this world, and there was no hope for me. But out of your kindness, you reached out to me and you loved me. And it was so kind of you. You didn't have to do it. You, did, you didn't have to, but you did it because you're good and you're kind. Thank you for being so kind to me. And thank you for blessing me. Thank you for giving me the friends that I have. Thank you for giving me the family that I have. I didn't deserve any of that. I didn't. But you were kind to me and you positioned me and you blessed me and you gave me what I didn't deserve. And I look to you with thanksgiving today. And today, Lord, I make the decision, and I'm asking everybody that's in this place to pray this with me. Lord, if I have aught against anyone, if there's anything in someone else that I need to forgive, I want to display kindness toward them and forgive them. I want to forgive them. I'm not saying that they're right. I'm not saying that my having an attitude is not justified. And I'm not saying that I won't deal with what is wrong and set it right. But Lord, through kindness, I reach out and I forgive them. I don't have to embrace wrong to embrace kindness. Lord, I'm just asking God that you do this work in us. Do this work in this beautiful people. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness, and thank you for your mercy. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Would you do that right now? Just right now. Just take a moment. Just take a moment and forgive. That's something you can do right now. You can show kindness right now sitting in that seat by forgiving. Forgiving someone. Come on, who did it? Who did it? Come on. You can release them now. Release them. Release them. Release them. Release them. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father, we praise you and we glorify you. We praise you and we glorify you in Jesus' name. We thank you for it. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Well, did I step on anybody's toes here this morning? If I, if I didn't, please understand it wasn't because I didn't try. If you'll come back next Sunday, I'll try to get your toes if I can. <laughs> oh, praise the Lord. Amen. We're going to have a great day today. We're going to have a great day today. We are. It's going to be awesome. I'm going to go play golf today, I think. God is good. Amen. But we're going to fellowship with one another. Let me just say we're going to be back here on Wednesday night over here next door. And listen, we are like minutes away from having this building here finished. We are there. 
and it's just it's going to come together quickly and we're going to be dismissing our kids in that new building uh we'll be as quick as we get this finished we're going to do a big dedication service for that building kind of a ribbon cutting thing and it's going to be so much fun so uh just be in prayer about that be back on wednesday night and angie is ladies meeting tonight at what time at five five thirty five thirty please we're going to be meeting next door. We'd love for all the ladies to go and be a part of that. All right? Let's all stand, if you would. Jason, would you take us out and, and worship and praise? Thank you, Lord.